I sometimes there we go. So thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, Fiona Sincotta here, Senior Market Analyst at City Index as we look to the week ahead. Just going to give it a few moments whilst we um, just wait for a few more people to join. Okay, excellent. So as always, just before we kick off, I'm going to ask you to just have a quick read through the risk warning um, whilst I put myself on silence and then we will get going because there is so much to get through this week, absolutely loads, so bear with me. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for reading through that. Uh, so let's jump straight in because as I said, there is a lot to be getting through um, with the week ahead. I mean, just to run by a few pointers as we have a look at the um, the economic calendar. Obviously, we've got the um, US non-farm payroll data, that's on Friday. Leading up to that, we have core PCE, the Federal Reserve's preferred gauge for inflation. We've also got Bank of Japan meeting, we've got Eurozone inflation, we've got UK budget, um, and we've also got big tech, Magnificent Seven earnings from the likes of Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, and Meta. So um, absolutely loads to be cracking on with. I think just um, before we actually get started on what we'll be looking at, just a very quick run through of um, where we are as we head into this week. We've had the US dollar is rising across the week. It's risen for a fourth straight week. It's reached a three month high almost against its major peers. And this is basically on those expectations that the um, Federal Reserve is going to uh, adopt a more gradual approach to cutting interest rates and also amid this uncertainty surrounding the US election where we've seen sort of Trump seemingly just taking a little bit of a lead but still it's far too close to call that uncertainty and the fact that we've got uncertainty surrounding you know Japanese uh, elections this weekend we've also got the budget in the UK we've got concerns over eurozone growth I think that's also just giving the US dollar a bit of that safe haven uh, flow demand support as well. So um, as far as US stocks are concerned, um, we have seen uh, a slight pullback this week after six straight weeks of gains. We've seen the S&P 500 just fall lower back from those all-time highs. Again, same story that's been driving the dollar, driving the US um, stocks, even though we've had earnings season coming in in full flow. We're not, um, we've seen that sort of uncertainty surrounding the US elections um, and the Federal Reserve um, next steps um, just really hurt uh, risk sentiment slightly. So just as we go into next week, as I said, we've got the US uh, non-farm payroll. We'll start with that. I know it's on Friday, but actually we're just going to look at everything US to start with. We've got the US non-farm payroll. We've also got core PCE. Um, which the uh, the market will be looking for continued cooling, be looking for ongoing strength and resilience in the US non-farm payrolls, particularly after the solid report in September. You know, recent data from the US has just been highlighting the resilience of the US economy. We've seen it um, really support this idea that the, the US economy is remaining resilient, even though we've um, seen, you know, interest rates remain elevated for a long period of time. Um, and, and that does mean that obviously the Federal Reserve uh, is cutting interest rates now, as we've seen, they've cut interest rates by that jumbo 50 basis point cut. Um, and now we're looking towards November and December. Obviously, with the strong data coming in, it does sort of mean that, well, you know, maybe the Fed aren't going to be cutting interest rates as aggressively as was initially expected. And that has boosted 
the, the US dollar was pulling the um, the US stocks lower and that we could continue to see it particularly I think we're also going to have all this uncertainty you know the week ahead of the US elections um, which are on the 5th of November so that's going to be creating a bit of a funny mood in the market as well so that's something to be um, watching out for but I think the other thing as far as the US is concerned is the US earnings. We've got big US earnings going on next week from the Magnificent Seven. Now these are the stocks that obviously have been very much in focus after the past over the past few years, helping the S&P 500 rally across most of last uh, this year. The Magnificent Seven are expected to report earnings increase, earnings growth of 18.1% year on year. Okay, to give you some perspective on that, that's if we took, we look at the remaining 493 companies, they were expected to see growth of 0.1%. So that just sort of allows us to understand the extent of, of, of this move um, that we are expected to see in the growth of these companies. Obviously, their share prices have been reflecting that solid move higher. NVIDIA and Alphabet they're expected to be leading the way, um, particularly surrounding the AI outlooks but i think we're getting to this stage in this rally let's just bring up the um the nasdaq because that's the one that i think is um a good one to be looking at obviously with all these tech stocks s p 500 also um but this is the nasdaq that we're watching here um the the idea is that we're sort of just going to be questioning a little bit here about the um expected sort of advantages of the AI revolution and and it is now expected to start broadening out that's what we're that the optimism is surrounding because you know half of this AI trade that we've been seeing with these big techs is you know they've been sort of the the first to benefit and um, but now we're sort of starting to see it potentially roll out well that could start benefiting the uh, you know smaller and mid-sized firms but I think there are still questions here over the level of of capital expenditure relating to AI and actually you know will these these large investments have payback and to the extent that they're being invested in so that's something that the market's going to be keen to be watching out for obviously we've also got political risk as well with Magnificent Seven the um, potential um, to do with the US election uh, obviously much more if Trump gets re-elected, the idea of tariffs and additional regulation um, on tech giants, additional regulation probably coming more from Kamala Harris than T Trump. Um, so, you know, these are the, 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 the areas that the market's going to be watching um, as we head into this last week. So this is something to be focused on. I'm not going to go through the individual um, uh, expectations for earnings and growth, but if you go onto the website, there is um, a piece on the Magnificent Seven and their earnings where you can see the breakdown of what we're expecting. But this is the NASDAQ 100 as we're watching it. Now, interestingly, the NASDAQ 100 has not reached fresh all-time highs as we've seen in the S&P and the Dow Jones in recent weeks. Um, it is been sort of trying to make it back up to its all-time high. It's trading within this rising triangle. We rebounded off the lower band just this week, in fact, just below the 20,000 level. Have seen it edge higher since. Buyers supported by the RSI of 50 are going to be looking for a break above the 20,500 level. If we can get above 20,500, that's going to bring the all-time high of 20,750 into focus. Um, just as far as the downside is concerned, then we'll be watching out for a fall below the 19,930, just below the 20,000. That was the weekly low. Below here, it exposes the 100 SMA around the 9,600 level. So, as I said, there's a lot to be going on next week. Not only have we got that, those earnings, but we've also got the um, the um, 
the uh, non-harm payrolls, the Q core PCE, where you know the market's going to be very much looking for, as I said, you know, ongoing strength in the data and a cooling in US inflation, which will be providing this scenario or this Goldilocks scenario whereby the Fed can continue to cut rates without, and the at the same time the US economy uh, heads for a a um, heads for a soft landing. So. Um, again, this is the S&P 500, just fallen away from those all-time highs that we saw um, last week, around the 58,800, uh, sorry, 5,880 level. Today, we, sorry, this week we saw a low there of the um, 50, 5,760. At the moment, momentum is remains on the side, um, and so buyers will be looking for, you know, that continuation of the Goldilocks scenario. Um, encouraging earnings that could help the uh, the the S and P 500 push higher, but I say again, just be wary over the the U S uh, elections and uncertainty, which I think you know we may struggle to see the S and P move higher just yet, unless we get blowout earnings. But again, as I said, you know I think there are going to be some questions just regarding um, the level of AI expenditure. Um, for these for these stocks, so that could hurt um, the outlook slightly. Um, so if we get a fall below that level here, 57,600, that's obviously going to bring in 5,700 round number, and then also the 50, 5670, which is the high that we saw in July, on the upside ahead of the uh, a break above uh, 5880 could bring 5,900 back into focus. Next thing I just want to focus on is the UK budget. Okay, so this is the first budget from the Labour government who got elected in July. And there has been quite a lot of, um, of um, media um, comments and a lot of focus on this new budget. Um, as it comes, it's the first Labour budget in 14 years, and basically we, you know, we've had the, the the Chancellor of the Exchequer and also the Prime Minister Keir Starmer being very vocal about the state of public finances, the dire state of public finances, and that they're expecting to have um, a painful budget is what we've heard um, for some. On the positive side, there are some positives in the sense that we have seen relatively decent growth numbers this year. We had the upward revision from the IMF as far as the growth outlook is concerned. And that can, you know, even small changes to GDP growth um, forecasts can give the uh, Chancellor uh, significantly more headroom as far as uh, as far as the the budget is concerned, now we've heard this figure being banded about that the the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves, is looking to raise around 40 billion through tax rises and also spending cuts, as well as changing the golden rules. That basically means this is sort of moving the goalposts almost, if you like, as far as um, what the golden rules are for the Exchequer. Now, we know already that they ruled out tax hikes for working people, such as the income tax or VAT. Um, but the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that any extra spending needs must be funded by tax hikes or borrowing. And that's what the market really cares about. You know, we don't obviously want to have a repeat, and Labour will be very cautious that they don't want a repeat of the Liz Truss uh, scenario disaster that we saw back in 2022 that sent the pound to a, uh, I can't remember what low, but sent the pound down to its lowest level against the US dollar for a very, very long time. There we go. There we can see it in all its glory down to uh, the, was it even a record low? Maybe it was there at uh, 103. Anyway, so we've seen a very strong recovery in the pound since then, even managing to reach the 134 level earlier this month. Um, but yeah, so I mean, as far as what to be watching, we could obviously see tax hikes, uh, capital gains tax, inheritance tax, they've all been mentioned. They're not massive 
um, revenue creators, but then we do also have the, the, the prospect of national insurance on employers, not employees, um, which is something that could create a significant, uh, uh, a reasonable amount for the for the uh, Chancellor. However, I mean, there is the possibility there that, you know, it could be um, a burden on the small and medium sized companies which make up the majority of the UK economy. They're the ones that the Chancellor needs to be careful not to cross the line. She needs, it's a very fine line that she's going to need to walk here where she's, you know, able to raise the money that she's looking to in order to repair the state of public finances but without putting un unnecessary and too much burden on um, on the small and medium sized companies which could create um, uh, uh, or could result in, in, in you know, troubles for those companies sort of actually employing people and, and continuing to uh, operate at a profitable level. Now, at the same time as tightening up on tax, um, the Chancellor is also likely to relax, as I said, the government's self-imposed rules on borrowing, and that is um, to increase investment. So, um, basically, they hope that spending more public money on, on, on sort of, you know, power networks or transports or other infrastructure um, will attract private investment. That is needed, really, to, to turn the UK economy into a faster-growing economy um, so the idea being that more investment is needed in order to get the economy moving um, that is what we'll be looking for I mean obviously we've also heard comments um, and we've seen particular sectors and um, uh, areas of the market um, already impacted and could be impacted further depending on what the details of of these um, tax increases are are, 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 are basically so I mean for example there has been some suggestion that there might be tax increase on on um, airplane tickets for example on flights you know so we might see a little bit of an impact on the on the airlines um, although I don't think that would be tremendous uh, impact and then we've also seen for example house building we've seen that that there is an area that could be potentially boosted um, by any um, favorable um, uh, policies by the Labour mark by the Labour government, and um, we've already heard that Labour intends to sort of really increase house building and home building. So we've seen, you know, house builders benefited from that. But I think it's also worth pointing out here that this budget is coming at quite an, a special time in the UK economy, where we've got inflation back below the Bank of England's one uh, two percent target fell to 1.7%, lowest level in uh, three years. And then, uh, so we've also got Bank of England cutting interest rates. So that obviously is going to help support um, consumption as well. And then if we've got the idea that the Labour aren't aiming to go for um, the working population, then there is an idea that, you know, potentially consumers will be supported because the fact that we've got those falling um, interest rates as well. So that could help, you know, more discretionary um, based sectors like retailers and service sectors in the UK. Um, so they are the things we're watching out for as far as gambling stocks there has been some suggestion that there could be some tax hikes for the gambling stocks and online casinos such as so, so you know watching out for um, the uh, that sector in the FTSE as well but so that's what we'll be looking out for as far as the um, the markets uh, the the budget is concerned but as I said what the markets are going to be keen to see is that she doesn't lean too far into tax hikes or or lean too far into borrowing for investment um, because that is you know if we're leaving, leaning too far in any direction that's when the market can get a little bit nervous about what that means for the outlook for the UK economy if that's being if we're hitting um, the uh, the population um, but also if we're hitting businesses what that could mean as well um, obviously too much borrowing never goes down well with the markets even if it is for, for borrowing, it needs to be funded um, in many cases. So this is the pound at the moment. We're obviously seeing it struggle down here. It had 
reached the 134.20 high um, at the beginning of October and well has been on a downward mission ever since. It's fallen below that key 130 level, tucked tuck to a low there of this rising trend line support, which dates back to what, April 20, uh, sorry, April uh, of this year. Now that's quite a key uh, level that we've sort of been been watching there. Um, so buyers are going to be looking to keep that 130 level in focus. Any recovery needs to get back over 130 because below 130 we're creating a lower low here. So that does sort of with combined with the RSI below 50. Oh gosh, where's that gone? Um, it does suggest that that, that we're in a downward uh, momentum here, but we'd need to be sort of taking out that 129 level in order to extend those losses towards the 200 SMA at 128. Obviously, if the market's not happy about the amount of tax cuts, uh, amount of tax hikes, sorry, and borrowing that's coming our way, then that could see the pound weaken um, quite significantly. But if the balance, if the market does feel it's balanced, and there is a chance, I think, that we've actually heard the 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 labour market sort of maybe speak it up um, a bit more than what it's going to be. Um, hopefully, that will mean that the pound will remain resported. And in fact, the focus will remain on the Bank of England and what the Bank of England can do as far as um, cutting interest rates is concerned. Um, so, yeah, so on the upside, if we've got to move above the 130, above there, you've got the, um, the 131 level, which is the high that we saw last week, which is needed in order to extend the gains back up towards that 132.50 level. Just having a quick look now at the, uh, the FTSE 100. Uh, just bear with me whilst I get that up. Okay, so here we go, FTSE 100. Actually, it's been trading, as you can see, in a really, you know, um, a pretty um, familiar pattern. Um, we did have a sort of an attempt to a breakout, um, but, you know, it's been, been within this sort of range of study 83.20, um, and then down here are the 81.50 for quite some time. We're finding a lot of support on the, the 100 SMA at the moment at the 82.50. But if we get a great break below there, then I think 8200 and then on the downside, 81.50 are the levels to be watching out for. Um, on the upside, you're going to be looking for 83.20 as a level to be watching. And then above here, we're looking for the 8400 but again this is all very familiar territory so we need a break above that 8400 really to create a higher high and bring that all-time high back into focus on the downside break below that 8150 brings 80,080 which is the 200 SMA back into focus okay so just keeping things moving here because there is so much to be getting through um the uh, we're going to have a look at USD, Japanese yen, because there's a lot going on as far as the yen is concerned. We've got the elections um, this weekend in Japan. Um, and basically, I mean, the, the the elections happen on Sunday. The Liberal Democrat Party, which is the ruling party, could lose, um, potentially lose its long held uh, dominance and, and basically that would create a level of uncertainty and, and potential political instability which could further cloud the Bank of Japan's monetary policy outlook. Now I do mention we also do have the Bank of Japan interest rate decision that's on the 31st. Okay so that's another one to be watching out for. They're not expected to hike rates but you know you've always got to have a level of caution with the bank of japan because they do like to surprise so that's just one to to keep in mind but i think um you know the data recent data hasn't supported further hikes we've seen core tokyo inflation fell below the two percent target we've seen pmis are contracting um you know the data doesn't necessarily i think support a further rate hike by the central bank at all um Plus, you've got this idea of political instability. Um, so as far as levels to be watching, obviously, if we get strong US data in as well next week, um, I mean, you know, inflation may be cooling, but if we still get the the, um, the non-farm payroll coming in solid, then that potentially could keep the US dollar rising and 
particularly when we've got the sort of, you know, US elections in focus as well. Buyers are going to be looking to get above this level here, the 130, 153.40. That's the fib, the 61.8% fib level from the 162 high to the 139.70 low. On the upside, um, because we've seen this really tremendous rally here. I mean, we did just sort of tip into overbought territory, but yeah, that's what we'll be looking for on the upside ahead of 155 round number and the 157. Fib level on the downside, we've got this support here, the 200 SMA, which is the 151.44, which is holding uh, up just as we speak. But if we get below that, you've got the 150.70, which is the 50% Fib level, um, and then below there, you've got the the 148. Obviously, you've got 150 uh, round number as well. So they're going to be the levels to be watching out for. Obviously, the um, Japanese authorities have also been um, warning about potential intervention. So that's something that we always just need to keep an eye on as well. Just shifting over to uh, Europe quickly, Euro US dollar. Euro US dollar, we've seen a little bit of a rebound, but the um, Euro US dollar is still set to fall across the week. We've got Eurozone inflation next week, we've got German inflation, we've also got German retail sales, we've also got um, GDP figures from Germany and the Eurozone. So a lot of data, you know, after this week's quiet data uh, week, really, we've got a lot coming in next week. Um, what I'll be looking out for, obviously, inflation is expected to remain below the um, ECB's 2% target level. We've seen ECB uh, policymakers talk about, you know, keeping interest rates lower, um, cutting interest rates further. It seems to be the natural progression, particularly with inflation below 2% target, but also because we've got these concerns over growth in the region. Um, PMI is highlighted again that we saw contraction. Um, in the economy, we've had the IMF downwardly revise growth for the region. IMF also saw um, expect Germany to contract again. So, I mean, you know, as far as growth is concerned, there are reasons to think that the ECB may need to uh, uh, cut rates more aggressively, and that's obviously not been supportive for the euro. Quite the opposite. I think the market's pricing in around a 40% probability of a 50 basis point cut at the next meeting. So suddenly 50 basis points are on the table for a couple of central banks now. Obviously, we've had the Bank of Canada cut by 50 basis points. We had the Fed cut by 50. And now we've got the ECB potentially considering it. Um, just as far as levels to be watching here, we've got it back above the 108 at the moment which has helped pull this out of overbought territory. It's, hit, it's um, been trading above the, the rising trend line. It's below the 200 SMA now. So, I mean, if buyers want to continue to encourage sort of further gains, then they, they had a lot of work to do. I mean, this, this, this uh, pattern is clearly in a downtrend right now. Um, they need to take out, sellers need to take out the 108 level again and also the weekly low of 107.60 to bring 107 into focus on the upside 200 SMA. You know, if we do get hotter than expected inflation, stronger than expected growth, that could help the, the euro uh, continue this recovery. But it needs to get any recovery really needs to move above that 200 SMA to get anywhere near, uh, you know, negating that downturn that we're a downtrend that we're in at the moment. Just finally, we're just going to have a quick look at the DAX. OK, and here we go. DAX is trading. You know, it's it's hit that all time high that we saw um, last week and it's fallen lower. Obviously, if we get any concerns about the growth um, prospects for the region, then that's going to hurt the DAX. Um, and we're just sort of struggling on this rising trend line, which has been in place since the middle of August. Um, so, you know, if we do, again, as I said, I think there's going to be this theme of uncertainty across the week, given the U.S., elections coming up um, in, in the beginning of November. Um, so, you know, again, with the East, with the, the ADEX, we may see it struggle to push to um, all-time highs. And just whilst we're talking about uncertainty, we've got time just to squeeze in a little bit of gold and what's going on there, because gold has been, um, you know, supported by this uncertainty that we've been seeing, not just, as I said, with the US uh, elections, but 
also you've got you know geopolitical tensions you've also got the 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 elections in japan we've got the budget we've got slowing growth in the eurozone so you know there are lots of reasons why safe haven gold has been uh, boosted not to mention obviously the central banks globally cutting interest rates and central banks also buying gold so you know um we we're seeing gold just consolidate after having a, you know a really steep tr uh, run up from that october um low so you know not unusual to have uh, this period of consolidation after we've seen well you know as we can see from the trend line uh, a series of higher highs and higher lows so on the outside buyers are going to be looking to rise above that 27 uh, 60 level and as far as support is con concerned i was going to say potentially um the weekly low is going to be an initial support at the 2700 below that watch out for 26 um 85 which is the high that we saw in september a lower low comes into place here around the 2600 level so that is all we have time for today um thank you so much for joining me and i look forward to seeing you again next week